Welcome to the History Nerd United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today, war correspondent and author Jane Ferguson joins us to talk her memoir, No Ordinary Assignment. This is what it comes down to, everybody. Any place that's been super dangerous the past 20 years, Jane's been there to report on it. And this memoir covers her life, all of the stories she's gone over. She's really open to just talking about everything. I had an awesome time talking to her. I think you're going to have an awesome time listening to this. So I'm going to shut up so we can talk to Jane. Let's do it. And here we are with a journalist and now author, Jane Ferguson, her book, No Ordinary Assignment. Jane, thank you so much for coming on. I'm excited to be here. Now, Jane, I pride myself on my research And so first things first, congratulations, you are a newlywed. I am very, very new. And uh, yeah, thank you. It's good research there because it was a very tiny little wedding. Uh, But the pictures came out great. Thank you. Social media makes it very easy to get that stuff out there if you're paying attention. Indeed, that's very true. Now, something else you're very new with is being on that side of a conversation where you're getting interviewed. I know you've just started doing it the past couple of days, right? How does it feel? It's very, very new to me. I mean, I get asked a lot, you know, for analysis on the Middle East, on what's going on in Afghanistan, to talk about national security and foreign affairs. And I sometimes get asked questions about journalism, but generally speaking, I very rarely get asked questions about myself. And what I've noticed is, as I've just started doing these interviews, is I rarely get asked questions where I suddenly realize this person has read a lot about me and they know everything from my book. You know, normally you can parse out information information uh, under your control and just be careful and cautious about how much you want to share. But it feels like uh, it's, it, this is an entirely different experience for me. Um, I suppose these are good, good experiences to have, but very new. Now, I'm about to say something to you that I think nobody else has said to you, but I was thinking about it and there was just something about your story that kind of seemed familiar to me. So I'm about to torture a metaphor, but go with me on this, please. You know, you come from humble beginnings. We're going to talk about that, right? You're in journalism. You're constantly putting yourself in danger. I'm just going to say that. And a big part of this book is you are almost never paid what you deserve. (laughs) So you're Spider-Man. I don't know if you know that. (laughs) I did not know that, but it makes so much sense now. It was was Spider-Man underpaid? Oh, constantly. That's devastating. His big thing is being underpaid underappreciated <laughs> and just it didn't seem like you got yelled at a lot. He seems to get yelled at a lot, but you seem to have some big meetings in here that might have been stressful for you, though. <laughs> That's certainly true. Yeah, it's so funny because a lot of people think many of us, uh, you know, television journalists also glamorous and it's also incredibly lucrative. But, you know, foreign correspondency is is not always that way. So, uh, yeah, that's um, that's de- any any freelance journalists on the road uh, listening to this are going to know exactly what we're talking about. It's definitely a misconception that people get into this business and get rich. <laughs> I've never seen it explained as well as you do in this book, but I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because one of the best things about this book to me is your first few chapters. Now, first of all, before we even get into that, can I just please compliment you on the titles of the chapters? Specifically, Uncle Desmond got kicked by a cow and short virgins will never make good war reporters. <laughs> Two of the best chapter titles I've heard in, in decades, quite honestly. I mean, I hope they're pretty intriguing. I think that often the best titles, the best headlines, whether you're writing for newspapers, it's usually just an incredible quote you heard somewhere along the way. Someone else said it. And, you know, that was the case for both of those. I'm hoping that people can kind of read those and be kind of intrigued by that and and drawn into the story. Your first two chapters are basically just you growing up in Northern Ireland and all that means with the troubles and everything like that. But what I found amazing is that there's very often when you're reading a memoir, you feel like something's missing or I don't understand why this person is the way they are. But when I finished those chapters of your childhood, I went, oh, I see why she might be running off to war. Like there was... You know, you're growing up humble beginnings, as we talked about. It kind of explained to me and primed to me why you might make the choices that you did. Now, is that something that you kind of put together when you were putting this together? or You kind of always known it. I've always wanted to write the book this way, but I didn't always know it. You know, this is a stage in my life where I've had a moment to stop and breathe and think and reflect and come to the end of certain, uh, certainly a period in my life that is documented in the book. 
I'm really glad that the first couple of chapters land well, because it's not just, and here's where I grew up, and here's some interesting tidbits about my childhood. The the opening of the book, so much of my earlier experiences created the person that I was. And when I wrote this book, I sat down with the absolute determination to explain why I ended up on this journey. And I say that very early on and, uh, you know, in, in introduction saying this book is meant to answer, or answer the question honestly. Why on earth do people become war reporters? Why do they go into conflict? We give half answers a lot of the time that are very true, that we care deeply about this work, that it matters, that it, it, it is an incredible. If you're a good communicator and you're good with people and you love people and you, and you love storytelling and you care about human rights, this is a great way for you to contribute as a professional. But it's not the whole story. Very often we are a tribe of relatively uh, restless, wandering souls. And when I started digging into how I would tell this story, I ended up connecting the dots backwards and connecting the dots. And I knew I had to be brutally honest about my origin story and where I came from, because I just don't think you can drop in 20 years later and really start to explain yourself. And I think you owe it to the readers, that level of self-awareness. Discovering those parts of me and where they came from has been you know, a years long process, but writing it in the book is something that from day one, I knew it had to open this way. And especially with the troubles, you talk about how it's kind of not talked about as you were growing up. Do you think that's probably one of the biggest pieces of it was that there was this war going on around you and you didn't quite understand it and you knew it existed, but you weren't getting the information to kind of understand it? Definitely, especially as an inquisitive kid. I think, you know, it's hard to tell what's nature and nurture, you know, what's your circumstances and your environment and what your, what, what is personality. And I was definitely this incredibly inquisitive kid who just asked questions all the time, but who happened to be growing up in a conflict that many people have heard about and they know something about. But what many people don't know is the cultural context. We are a very, very understated culture where you do not draw attention to yourself. You know, you do not overstate anything, quite stern-lipped, quite private uh, Ulster Scots community. And also, this isn't a war as many people might uh, imagine it, you know, with violence in the street everywhere. It's more of a, of a, of a quiet, deadly insurgency that pops up. And I think also the fact that the two communities were so, so, so divided, and yet nobody really wanted to talk about it. So you're growing up in a strange kind of information vacuum, where as a child, people just don't discuss that. I remember in the early days of my career as a, as a foreign correspondent, as a war reporter, I would bump into much more veteran journalists who had covered the conflict in Ireland, who were who were much older than me. And they would be like, oh, of course, you're from Northern Ireland. That makes perfect sense. And I used to bristle against it. And I'd be like, no, that has no that has no bearing whatsoever on why I'm a war reporter. And eventually, after years and years of spending time with insurgencies, and it really became something that was that was obviously a massive preoccupation for me professionally. What makes people uh, commit acts of violence like otherwise ordinary people, you know, bakers and taxi drivers and and farmers? What makes them? make a bomb or or shoot someone. I think deep down, there's no denying that growing up down the road from these mysterious bad men had a huge impact on me as a kid. And the personal stuff doesn't end, right? Because there's a version of this book where you pull out a lot of the more personal stuff. And the first few chapters where you talk about your family and how those dynamics worked, it doesn't stop there because, I mean, you add other tidbits of your actual home life and partners and things like that throughout that I thought was really interesting because I sat there and I'm like, there's a lot of authors who would pull these pieces out and just say the memoir is about me being a war correspondent. What made you decide that you wanted to kind of give that full 360 view of your life? Because I don't think I could really answer the original question without giving a full picture of me as a person and my life life. First of all, the nature of our work as foreign correspondents, work and personal life gets so intermingled and so impact one another that it's very, very difficult to really separate the two. I want the reader to understand who these foreign correspondents and war reporters are, you know, beyond professionals, who they are as people. And I have to be open and honest about the experiences that someone like me might be going through while doing the work. A lot of people think, oh, my goodness, you know, you're you're in a massacre in Cairo. 
I, I mean, there must be nothing else that exists in your life. This must be the only thing that exists. But the truth is, we're all human beings. We're all dealing with relationship issues and people have kids and people have, have family drama and they have, you know, everybody is an actual human being. And sometimes you have to actually put it out there so people can understand the context of what you're going through. That on the one hand, our work tends to take over our lives. But on the other hand, we're still scrambling to have a personal life and to grow through that personal life as well. And I think writing only about my work in a memoir like this, where I'm really trying to, to answer that, that fundamental question of why and, and, and who we are, I think that will give half person to the reader. I've also spent years being asked by random people, you know, or, or, or friends, but mostly people who don't know me asking, you know, about my life as a war reporter. And deep down, I, I think a lot of them are too shy to ask me about my personal life. You know, they're like, well, how does that work? And, you know, could you have a kid? I mean, I don't understand. And so, you know, I really wanted to be extremely open and honest about all of that. And I mean, you're very devoted to your career. I mean, other than the fact that you put yourself in extremely dangerous situations. I wanted to ask you at least a few questions so that we could hear your accent for a few minutes because <laughs> I'm sure some people would say, you know what, that doesn't, that doesn't feel completely like a, an Irish accent, but <laughs> it's kind of an example of how devoted you are, right? Look, identity is a theme woven through the book, uh, woven through my life, trying to find out who it is you really are, but also somehow fit a mold of what you've got to be in order to keep doing this kind of work. And so it's always been a part of my adult life for years, you know, whether you're at boarding school in the United States and people are like, you know, intrigued by your accent or whether you're, you know, then coming home and, and working in a factory and, you know, accent is political, accent is Class accent is so much. I mean, I remember, you know, being rejected from, from jobs because of my accent. And it ended up becoming this molded part of me that I really wouldn't, I, I was kind of embarrassed to admit because there's a sense that it's, there's something unethical about abandoning the, the, you know, the accent you grew up with. It's a little bit taboo to do that. And I just at many times find myself trying to fit in and trying to sort of fit a specific mold I thought I was supposed to fit. And now jumping to kind of where this really all started when we talk about the amazing war correspondent, it seems like Yemen is kind of where that starts. And that's a very special place for you. Can you just tell me a little bit about the first time you went there and what you were feeling? I graduated college uh, in 2007 and scrambled and scrambled and desperately tried to find a job uh, in journalism, anything at all. And I just was struggling so badly. And I was given an opportunity. Someone gave me a gift whereby I was finally able to afford for a few months to fly to Yemen to study Arabic. And it was, I'd been taking the odd class in college in England, but I'd grown up like dreaming that I would go out and live in the Middle East. And so I thought, well, maybe I could at least go and study Arabic and, you know, in person and make better use of my time and see if I could just somehow find a job or something, make it work. Because it was, the financial crisis was just rolling across the world. And I flew to Yemen. And of course, you know, as this youngster, I didn't pick Yemen because I had considered some very high historical context, I was looking at where was the cheapest place for me to study Arabic. And everybody back then, they would study in Damascus or Beirut or Cairo, or some of the slightly more adventurous ones might go to Sana'a, capital of Yemen. And then when I started researching it, it just looked like this magical place. And it was very, very, you know, off the beaten track. And, and I, you know, I was just fascinated so I booked a plane ticket on an airline called Yemenia Airways, which back then was allowed to fly from London Heathrow. And I flew by myself after college to Yemen with a backpack and a hope that I could somehow, you know, turn this into a life. It's just very strange hearing you say this, especially reading in the book that you really fell in love with Yemen. And I'm watching you talk and I'm thinking about my eight-year-old daughter. And if she had told me after college, hey, I'm going to Yemen, I'd be like, no, you're not. <laughs> Listen, especially when you go to Afghanistan, like, first of all, I'm sitting there going, I mean, I know how I would have gotten to Afghanistan on a military plane because they would have sent me and I didn't have a choice. There are multiple places you've been in your life where it's kind of like somebody had to have said to you, Jane, what the hell are you doing? Where are you? No, no. I mean, has did anybody even try and stop you or did they know that they couldn't? 
Nobody tried to stop me from going to Yemen. I think most people by that stage, you know, had come to know that one important thing about me is that usually when I say I'm going to do something, I typically do it. Very shortly after moving to Yemen, I ended up as a journalist. And, you know, the truth is, eventually I ended up just in, 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 in a social circle of other war reporters, you know, where we rarely, there might be the odd story where we'd be like, are you sure? But most of the time you're talking over a drink down the pub and you're like, oh, I'm thinking about going to blah, blah, blah. And everyone will say, great idea. <laughs> so I guess we tend to surround ourselves with people who think similarly. And then you go from Yemen, where's your next stop, right? Because it, it certainly didn't stop there. You just kept going. No, I stayed and stayed and stayed as long as I could afford to, like right down to like the the last kind of bowl of pasta I could make myself or, or like street kebab I could afford. And eventually I did have to go home and go. I went back to England, stayed with some friends and got a job in the local pub. But as far as I was concerned, I now lived in the Middle East. And so I started applying for any single job there could ever be. And I got a job at a newspaper in Dubai. I responded to an advertisement online and it was the biggest English language newspaper in the Middle East. And they needed a sub editor on the sports section, which is basically like the person who receives the copy written by real journalists and then, you know, does a spell check, tries to, you know, we used to use this, the software that would fit it into the page because, of course, it was all just print back then. It was real print and uh, newspaper advertising was still alive and well in Dubai. And so I managed to get a job in Dubai. Now, it wasn't exactly very rugged and interesting and, and, and uh, it was wasn't kind of like living in Yemen, but I at least was in the Arab world and I had a paying job in a newsroom. So it was, as far as I was concerned, it was a step forward. And I flew out there and I just figured I'd make it up from there. And luckily you didn't have anything go wrong. You didn't have to do anything crazy to kind of keep clawing your way up as a journalist, right? Like you just, you just kept showing no, up to No, my work. career was pretty much a smooth trajectory smooth right from, from there, there on right? in. Like, yeah. Part of the reason I wanted to write the book was I, I got so tired of reading books about people whose careers had just gone so terrifically smoothly, you know, and like I wanted young people to read it and realize that, you know, you can be kind of, you know, in a good way, your career can be just as defined by your failures, you know, I mean, I... I struggled so hard and I just wouldn't give up. You know, I tried to get jobs in TV, but you have to understand that at the time, I didn't even know how you got a job in TV. Like, I didn't understand that you were supposed to get an agent, that you were supposed to fly to New York and talk to, and then the agent would set you up with something called talent executives. I didn't even know that they would call a journalist who went on the television talent. This was just wild to me. And so I was just scrambling and trying to figure it out and taking every opportunity that I could. And then at one stage, I realized that, you know, after a long time, having a really very ni nice life and good job at the newspaper, I'd been promoted to being a, a, a features writer, which was a great job. You know, I mean, I, business reporting was not my passion, but I appreciated having a byline and a paying job in journalism. It felt really cool. And I worked like crazy. But eventually I realized, you know, I mean, I, this was not the plan. When I left Yemen, the plan was to, you know, be in Iraq and Afghanistan and covering, you know, stories that impacted millions of people's lives and, and that were, you know, major, major global stories. And so I had reached this crossroads where I thought, you know, I can keep on this track and have a very nice life as a business reporter based in the Middle East, you know, and the kind of glamorous Dubai life, or I can, Make a change. And, and I just, I just got this feeling one day. I was at a, a, a car dealership covering a, the launch of a new car. And it's just a generic kind of story, uh, you know, on auto sales in the UAE. And I just kind of got this moment where I thought, I can't waste another second. I just feel as though I can't keep waiting to do the job that I want to do to live the life that I. Um, so my real to wait for my real life to begin, as Colin Hay says in that song, you know. So I just knew I had to act. So I just bought a ticket to Afghanistan, and I thought I'll figure it out from here. Well, I mean, luckily that was a great plan, and there wasn't any fallout. And you didn't get fired or anything, right? Like they were as <laughs> soon as you got back to work, they're like so happy to have you back, right? <laughs> Well, that was actually, yeah, I, I came back from uh, from Afghanistan determined to do, because I had done print work out there for the newspaper, and I went to Yemen. Of course, it's funny how life is uh, and uh, cyclical. I went back to Yemen uh, where I, I managed to, on my vacation time, I managed to get 
a story where I had pretty great access to a very lesser covered conflict in the north with rebels in the north that had been attacking Saudi Arabia. And this conflict had started to become uh, international because the Saudis had started uh, flying fighter jets into Yemen. And I flew out there with a cameraman and went up and filmed it. You know, the vice president of Yemen showed up and I doorstepped him and I got a sound bite. And this was my first ever time ever doing any TV work. And I came back to the UAE and I drove up to CNN and Abu Dhabi and I sold it to the to the manager there who ended up becoming a very close friend and mentor over the years. And I was just this kid, this like 24 year old kid who had walked into his office a few weeks earlier and said, I'm going to go to Yemen. And he looked at me and was like, very good, as though I would never do that. But of course, I always do what I say I'm going to do. And so I came back with this story and he bought it and he aired it. And I was marched from the newsroom of my job <laughs> the next day <laughs> for working for a rival news outlet, which is a little bit of a stretch that CNN, um, for someone who would do anything for my career, like it was, it was quite astonishing to be fired from my first paying job in journalism. And have it be one of the best thing that's ever happened to you, too. Definitely. I feel like especially that part of this book, I'm sitting there going, if you wrote that in a Hollywood script, they'd be like, this is so stupid. <laughs> oh, this is so cliche. Oh, she steps up against her bosses and she gets fired, but it's great. And it's like, that's your life. How does that feel? <laughs> well, I mean... I do look back at that young woman. I think it's a big part of writing a, a memoir is that you look back at your younger self almost in the abstract. It's like she's a she's this person that I've come to know. And I do look at her and I think, wow, you were so insecure and so humble and yet so kind of punchy and ballsy. I mean, like I look back and I go, wow, you know, you were I think I admire that I did that, but I also look back and think, gosh, did you have to like like, did everything have to be so dramatic, Janie? <laughs> oh, I look back on 24-year-old me. I'd love to slap that guy. I mean, <laughs> what an idiot. We're not, we're not going to relive that right now. I don't need to be crying on a podcast. A, a big part of this, and I, I have some very technical questions as far as for journalism is concerned, but you were in Syria and things got pretty crazy there. Can you just talk about getting into Syria, what was going on then, and is on the danger level of 1 to 10 – how dangerous was Syria when you were there? Honestly, at the time and looking back now, having done everything I've done in my career, it was 15. Honestly, out of one to 10, I still look back and, and get a little like, whoa, you know, to put in context, we had post 9-11, a lot of conflict reporting and foreign correspondency in the region had been, you know, embeds with Western militaries or, or government militaries. You know, you're, you're either with the military of Afghanistan or Iraq or the Americans or NATO partners. And, or you might be reporting unilaterally, but generally speaking, most reporters had experience with these militaries. Then the Arab Spring happened. And my generation was very much so the generation of the Arab Spring. We really found our footing covering the massive protest movements. These protest movements, unfortunately, you know, as, as we all know now, there was a real pushback, a lot of resistance from uh, dictatorships that just uh, dug their heels in. Syria was the most tragic example of that, where it turned into a civil war. And so we find ourselves as journalists now, you know, uh, embedding with rebel groups, with insurgent groups, and they are a lot less safe to be with simply because they're so outnumbered, outmanned, outgunned. So you end up, especially in the early, very fragile stages of many of these insurgencies. And in, in Syria, you know, other journalists had these experiences. You're going in with David, not Goliath. And it is extraordinarily dangerous. And, you know, in many cases, I felt like, you know, perhaps the rebels had sort of exaggerated, or certainly the activists exaggerated how strong they were. You know, don't worry, we'll do this, we'll do this, because they were so confident, almost nihilistic, which is what they had to be, because look at what they were facing. I mean, the Assad regime, with its sadism and its absolute determination to do anything to survive. So these these young men were were facing almost certain death anyway. So going in with them was was terrifying. And so, so we, uh, they smuggled me in, effectively. I met with them in Beirut, and I was handed, and I, you know, I had to 
cut down parts of the book because it was so long winded, you know, getting handed from this safe house to this safe house to this safe house. And eventually you get across the border. For me, I, I literally just ran across a muddy field and scrambled under, under a wire fence. And then that was me in Syria. And then I get picked up by, by rebels. And very quickly I realize they control very, very little territory. Um, and there's a lot of Hail Mary passes as we're just driving through regime controlled areas. And so from the very second I crawled onto that wire fence, I started wondering if I'd gone too far. You know, I was only 27 at the time. I had a, a huge amount of cash in my bag, a, a camera and a flak jacket. I think I had like a like a toothbrush and a hairbrush and some contact lenses. I just didn't have the experience to know I, I was alone. And part of the problem of working alone, and I still think one man or one woman bands are not good. I think you need to be two people. I didn't know if I was just being a chicken shit or if actually this was crazy and I needed to leave. I didn't have the experience to know. And I followed these young men around for several days and was absolutely terrified the whole time. I was able to function. I was able to work. I was able to film them, but I'd never felt fear like that before. You know, we were surrounded by, you know, they'd smuggled me into a tiny neighborhood that was being bombarded by the regime. And we were absolutely surrounded. Now, this was in the early, early stages. There weren't airstrikes yet, um, but there was, there was artillery shells and, and, um, and snipers surrounding the area. And we knew the reason that, that we went into report was we knew the government were going to move in. There was going to be a raid, but we had no idea when. And so it was really Russian roulette how long I stayed. So eventually, after a few days, I left and I had planned to go in for a week, but I left and I was so ashamed that I left early because I thought that's not what we're reporters do. We're, you know, we're, I'm, I'm ballsy and I'm ballsy like the guys. Don't forget, you know, I mean, it's not because I'm a woman. And so uh, that was a very immature part of me that was that, that felt like that. And then as we were leaving again, I mean, I'm aware that these guys are smuggling me out of an area they really don't control. They don't control those roads. And they took me out and drove me to the Lebanese border along the, the smuggling routes. We, there were plenty of pe people would smuggle bits and bobs of uh, oil and fuel. Little trucks would take those roads. And so I could see the tracks ahead through the dirt. Um, but there were times when we, we drove past one Syrian military uh, base like right next to it, like 20 meters from the wall. And they, they fired a flare over the top of the vehicle just to make sure that we, that we were just smugglers, so to speak, and not rebels. They had no idea. And yeah. And then we were stopped at, by, by two men at, you know, in the middle of the night in a field. I had no idea who they were and I couldn't understand what was going on, but I've never ever felt as certain, uh, you know, my time was up when I left Syria. I was very, very lucky to get out alive. And the next journalist to be brought in by the rebels and by the activists was Marie Colvin. So I was just extraordinarily lucky. And I'm glad that I was a little bit of a chicken shit. I mean, it's something to point out, too, if people don't know who Marie Colvin is. She was another war correspondent who was killed, unfortunately, then. It kind of makes me think about it because people will talk about this when you see people like yourself in these situations. And I think you kind of talked about it. It sounds like you were young. You really weren't thinking it through necessarily. How much of it is getting the story right, feeling that it's important and having that valiant feeling. And then how much of it, honestly, is ego? Like you want to get the story because you know all people are going to say I'm awesome after this. It's such an important question. And I write about this a little bit afterwards when I'm when I'm struggling with why did I do that? You know, I asked myself that question for the first time in my career. Did I do that out of bravado? Did I do that to try to prove myself as just as tough as all the others? Did I do that for my career or did I do that because it mattered? I'm the right person for the job. Um, the job is important. You know, these are the kind of questions that I think very, very few conflict reporters ever want to answer in public. But they must ask themselves, you know, why am I doing this specific risky thing? Is it to beat the competition? Is it for my career or is it because I know I can do this? I am the right person for the job. And I questioned and questioned myself afterwards. After that, I know I was young and very hungry and very unsure of what it was I was supposed to do to build this career. I thought this was the work. 
you know, I had these ideas I'd grown up with. I think I was also really, really trying to be accepted at Al Jazeera as a correspondent. But at the same time, I knew I had the courage to do that in some ways. Like I, I felt like doing that assignment was something that I was well suited for because I, I felt like I had, I could tough it out. And there, there's a part of you as a reporter that just feels like the ability to go in somewhere where people are being purposely silenced. That is the job, you know, getting in there and getting that story out is the most important thing that you can do when you're when you're reporting on people who are rising up against dictatorships. So for me, it mattered a lot editorially. I do sometimes wonder whether the risks I took at the time might have been, you know, the bravado of a youngster trying her, her best to fit into this set of war reporters and, and find a place for herself in the industry. Syria became, for me, as well as many other reporters, something that mattered so, so much that, the it, you know, all of these people around us were putting their lives on the line. It felt like we had to do it, too. And this seems to be a big piece in your life where PTSD kind of starts to come to the forefront, right? That you may have had certain things that you felt at a certain point, but it seems like post-Syria – that's where you start to feel all of that stress and all of that danger. What did that feel like for you where you finally said, hey, this isn't normal how I'm reacting right now? You know, I've been in dangerous situations before where I felt sort of hyper aware, hyper alert, but it's always faded away. Within a few hours afterwards, I'll be exhausted. I'll eat something sugary. I'll go to sleep. But Syria, the fear that I felt that whole time that I was just describing to you, the fear I felt when I was moving around inside of Syria stayed with me. Even though rationally I knew the danger was gone, I just stayed on high alert. It just felt like an alarm bell had been turned on and it wouldn't go off. And I scared myself one night and get to the hotel in Doha. So I, I go straight from Beirut. I'm covered in mud still from for like scrambling across uh, fields in the middle of the night to escape Syria. I'm still covered in mud. I fly to Doha and I go to the office. I'm heralded this great hero. Well done. Well done. And then I go back to the quiet of my hotel room where I'm no longer distracted by camera and lights and makeup and chat and, oh, what was it like? And all the producers who want to talk to you. And then I'm silent in this hotel room and I'm trying to sleep. And I am convinced that there are Syrian government agents in my bedroom somewhere, maybe in the bathroom, you know, and I can't sleep. In the taxi on the way there from on the way home to the hotel from work, I had wondered if anybody was following me in another car. I mean, that level of paranoia that the state was coming after me, that they were there. I got out of bed, couldn't sleep, went into the bathroom. I checked the wardrobe and the bathroom for Syrian agents. And that's when I thought, this is not right. I am not okay. Well, luckily, um, you got great help right away because people are just <laughs> awesome at diagnosing and supporting this, right? Yeah, this was definitely uh, the early days of, of, of this really being recognized and, and important in journalism. Like I, uh, I, I got given a, a phone number to call for like teletherapy. And, you know, it really, it, it's so funny. I write about this in the book. It, there was like a kind of ticking off of something, I, I, you know, like, are you suicidal? Are you having flashbacks? And I was like, well, no, I mean, I'm not sleeping very well. I feel very anxious. You know, and that was pretty much it. It was, it was like, I kind of got the impression that they wanted to make sure that you weren't about to end your life and otherwise you're fine. And so it, you know, there was, there was really, really no sense of the need to come down from that kind of experience to receive journalists and for them to have a decompression moment. And it was scary because when you recognize that you are experiencing PTSD, you fear immediately that it's the new norm and that it'll never go away. And so that was what I was really, really afraid of. And so I was running away, trying to shake it. And I, it helped that, you know, my partner at the time met me and I flew to Istanbul. And we sat and talked about it and talking it through. And actually, you know, it was basically a therapy session where I'll explain. I, I didn't know this at the time. I look back now, you know, I mean, I, I see a therapist. I talk about, about my work all the time. I'm, I'm very much so active about working through the emotions of these experiences. But at the time, I didn't know that. And I was just describing my fear and, 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 and I could start to feel even just the biochemistry of my body change as I talked about it. I was diagnosed around the same time that you were in the book when this started coming up. And 
unfortunately, I had a lot of the same things that you did from, hey, or, oh, if you're not going to commit suicide, then this is not really a problem. You're going to be fine. Right. And I mean, especially the, the same symptoms, too. Uh, I had a lot of people in my life, you know, very well-meaning, just say, like, well, when do you feel it? And it's like, it's this time, it's this time. If somebody ticks me off, it'll be bigger. And they'll say, well, these things right make me feel this way as well. And I always explain PTSD doesn't mean I go off at the wrong times. It means I can't come back down. And something that will piss you off at a four, I'm at a nine. And I'm at a nine for a day yeah. or two days when you forget it 10 minutes later. And it's still something I know that people are trying to figure out. It's not something that a lot of people want to talk about. Exactly. That area where you're not okay, but you're able to function, it massively impacts the quality of your life. And, you know, I think that that, that is something that I think people struggle to understand that it is effectively a massive expansion of your emotions. And, and I think that, that that's, it's, it, it takes a long time to come down from it. And, you know, I think, I, I just think it's something that many people are looking for a specific problem for the specific answer to it. And it's just too complex. It's too, it's too much of a gray area between I'm suicidal or there was this one event and therefore I just need to deal with this one event and then I'll be fine. But it's, it's actually it's actually much, much more different when you've experienced an extraordinary level of fear or anxiety or danger or any kind of trauma. And, it, you know, it it can basically set your emotions off off kilter in a way that it can be very, very hard to get them back on on track. It certainly takes time. So I think it's safe to say that 27-year-old Jane had a certain criteria for going somewhere, and now today's Jane probably has a bit more strict criteria, right? Please tell me that's true. 27-year-old Jane got a bit of sense knocked into her. Um, I think, you know, that was the silver lining of that experience was to no longer ever feel shame about you know, whether or not I'm brave enough or, you know, I came out of that experience feeling like I have nothing to prove to anybody about this anymore. And that was a big moment of maturing as a reporter. I mean, look, you know, these days I still take, I've taken, you know, massive risks in my work over the last few years, but I would say for me, it's very much so curated to how much of an impact can I make for this specific story, how much are we going to get like reward to risk in the sense that like, will I be able to make a difference here? Am I taking this risk because I know it's going to have a massive impact? There's no news getting out of there. If I do this, this will matter. No one else is, 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 um, is getting in there. That tends to be something that I put down as a criteria that I would take risks for. I am, you know, newly married to someone who is not a journalist and who, you know, I think would definitely, we've had long chats about risk and, and, you know, what worth it and what's not. And I think I'm definitely more, slightly more risk averse these days. It's partly because I just don't know that I can do that my whole life. You know, like we put our lives on the line and I sort of wonder whether or not it's really sustainable for decades and decades for me or whether or not I can pivot in some way. I still cover war. I still take a lot of risks in my work, but I'm perhaps a lot less hard charging than I was back then. Yeah, I mean, one year in the Middle East for me was plenty. I don't need to be going back. You can have that area. You go right ahead. <laughs> so you're going to be talking up the book for a few months, right? I'm not going to see you on TV from Ukraine tomorrow is what you're telling me. Not right now. I'm hoping to get back on the road before the end of the summer, but I'm not quite sure where yet at the moment. I'm trying different things. I doubt if it will be Ukraine, um, but I'm looking at some of my other old, other beats that I might be interested in going to. So I might do some of that. I'm going to start teaching at Princeton again in September. So between now and then, I would like to do one more assignment. Okay, so Lord knows where Jane's going to be in a few months. <laughs> you heard it here, listeners. We don't know where she's going to be. So one more question. We founded History Nerds United because, you know, history, stuff like that. People say history, or in this case, nonfiction, that stuff's boring. You know, now these people are wrong. We know that. But if I got one of those people in front of you that says, I only read novels, I only read this. They, and they said to you, why should I read No Ordinary Assignment? What would you say to them? No Ordinary Assignment is history happening. 
it's history in real time. You know, it's it's someone who is going to literally walk you through history, whether or not it's the Arab Spring or the surge in Afghanistan or the fall of Kabul or you name it. You know, this is history happening, but in real time. And as you have pointed out, some of it is stranger than fiction. And I can attest to the fact that real lives that are extraordinary and fascinating and wild can can beat fiction any any day of the month because it's real. And that's why. Amen. Jane, thank you so much for coming on. The book is great. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. Jane, thank you so much for coming on. No ordinary assignment. And listen, everyone's going to love this book. Doesn't matter what you're into. Trust me, you're going to love this book. Go out and get it. In the meantime, nerds, hit us up. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You know where we are. Come on, we're putting out all sorts of good history stuff all week. So go on, follow us, listen to the podcast, give us five-star ratings, please. It really helps. Until next time, stay cool, nerds. Nerds.